Okay, welcome. I've been promising Egypt for a while and keep coming up with other things to do. So now we actually get Egypt, which is my favorite topic. So you can tell I'm at least excited. I've been waiting for this for a while. But I want to try to make you excited. So why in the world would someone care about Egypt? Let me see if I can give you a reason. This one's interesting. Does anyone know who that is? No. So Ramses II. That's Ramses the Second. Yes, very close though. They were they were at least sort of in the New Kingdom. And, um, what you may not know about Ramses is, is he had a bunch of wives. He was a he was a very um, active polygamist, and as uh, an active polygamist, he had a lot of children, <laughs> over a hundred, and he tended to farm his children off uh, in marriages to nations around him as part of making treaties. For example, the Hittites and the Egyptians were huge enemies. Ramses went and fought a major battle with the Hittites. So he writes on, draws on all his temple walls where you know, he claims to have rallied the troops when they were about to lose and single-handedly rushed the enemy and they all, all the troops followed him and he saved the day. And he put that on all his walls. The Hittites were Egyptians' enemies, but they made friends with the Hittites during his reign and he sent his daughter over there to be married. Um, what that means, and I'm not going to do the statistics, the math isn't important, but trust me, if you want, we can go through the math after. But if you do the math, there is as close to zero as, you know, since the universe began, if we ran this experiment a million times, you know, every second since the universe began, it would never happen, that you are not descended from Ramses. <laughs> Okay, so this is your great, 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 something great grandfather, several different ways. Uh, and then the reason we know that is because of the, the way your number of ancestors doubles as you go back a generation and, and how many people were alive at the time. You have you know, infinitely more ancestors than there were people alive at the time. And so Ramses is your ancestor many times over, down many of your genealogical lines. So, so ancient history is family history in a really interesting and fascinating way. The other weird bit about this is trivia. He probably contributed, all, contributed zero or next to zero of your DNA, but he's still your ancestor um, because you have more ancestors than you do bits of DNA. Um, the other thing is just to think about how old this is. Um, if you want to study a nation that we actually know something about, this is as old as you can go, really. This or Samaria. Um, this is a jet, um, jet um, Horus, name written on a pillar. Um, this is one of the pre-dynastic or first dynasty, I think, pharaohs. Uh, so we're talking 3000 BC, which is 5,000 years ago. So this is, you can read about these people, you can see their names, you can look at things they made 5,000 years ago. This is fascinating stuff. Um, the other is the really interesting continuity of Egyptian culture and thought for 3,000 years. Uh, you can look at the image on the left, this guy, and you can say, ah, that's Egyptian. And you can look at the one on the right, and even if you don't know anything about Egypt, you can say, ah, that's Egyptian. However, uh, these things have about 2,000 years between them. I don't want to put 2,000 years into perspective. The USA has been a nation for 200 years about, give or take. These are 2,000 years apart, and they both look Egyptian. So if you take art that was made 100 years ago, and the art that you would see down um, Santa Fe, down a, at a, at a, at a you know, museum or a, a gallery in Santa Fe, they don't look anything alike. And yet the statues from Egypt are the same for 3,000 and more years. Just pick two that happen to be 2,000 years apart. There's a huge continuity here, and there's a reason for the continuity, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, you also get one of the first monarchs in history. You get one of the first states with big work projects, both for irrigation and for building pyramids, so public, public um, state extravaganzas, uh, with kings leading them, and and they, they generate a huge bureaucracy to make all this happen. And can you imagine, I don't, I don't think you can even begin to comprehend the logistics required to feed the workers that built the pyramids. 
And it's just, it's huge. And yet they managed it, and they managed it without computers uh, to keep track of, you know, salaries. And these weren't slaves. These were people that were actually employed. So they had to pay them all. Uh, and and just, just the, the sheer logistics of that is a nightmare. Moving the blocks, timing when the blocks arrive, figuring out which blocks go where, getting the right workmen to the right place, and then feeding them all. And they had a bureaucracy that made all of that work. So I think really there's a lot you can learn about everything from government to the earliest formation of states uh, to, to what it means to have a king and a ruler and to divest some of your authority into another person to, to be your leader. Uh, and warfare. In some of the earliest scenes of warfare, they have great depictions of how they fought, why they fought, the tactics of battles are described. So whatever you're interested in, Egypt is probably the place to go to find the earliest examples of whatever it is that floats your boat. Um, monumental architecture. So I'm talking about the pyramids and the Sphinx. But not only did they build monumental architecture, they built the biggest and the baddest and the greatest in the ancient world. And I don't think we, but the pyramids were the tallest building mankind had ever built until I believe the Eiffel Tower. Just to push how far into the future. And the, the pyramids were 1,000 years old when Tutankhamun was buried. And they were about 2,000 years old when Cleopatra um, died. 2,000, 2000, 2000 and a half when Cleopatra and Mark Anthony had their love twist and, and died at the hands of the writer while well, she committed suicide. So this, you can go, go watch the Shakespeare play again if you haven't seen it. But that was, can you imagine? What that means, how old the pyramids were in her day. And then think of how old they were in our day. And they remained the tallest building mankind had ever constructed until the Tower, until the Tower of London. Um, and then for me, this one was the one that got me. This is why I got into Egypt. This, this stuff, you just look at it and you go, what is that? And what does it mean? And what does it say? And, and I, I don't know about you, but I look at that and it's like a code that just must be cracked. And it's, it's a mystery and a puzzle that I have to put together and figure out what it all means or it's going to drive me insane. <laughs> so this is just me. I, I love ancient languages and I love hieroglyphs. And these, this, this for me mixes art and language and mystery all together in just kind of this perfect package that just makes me all happy inside. <laughs> because I just got to know what this means. And if you happen to be interested in religion, which is my second favorite you know, kind of thing, probably my first, the language is the second. If you happen to be interested in religion, this is the oldest corpus of religious texts known to man. Actually, this is a picture from the tomb of Teddy I. The actual oldest is from his father, or his, no, not his father, because there's a dynasty change, but the king before him. And unfortunately, I didn't get to go in his t temple. I got to go in Teddy's. So I got, you know, the second oldest, um, because I got one pharaoh too late. But anyway, written on this wall is just, just every inch is covered with hieroglyphs, and it's a it's a religious text. It's the equivalent of the Egyptian Bible, is maybe the best way to describe it, and it's ancient, and it's the oldest one we have. Now there's some debate about whether Sumerian, whether the Sumerians developed writing before the Egyptians, and no one really knows. But the Sumerians seem to be winning right now, unless we find something else older in Egypt tomorrow. The Sumerians probably won that particular race. But what we don't have from Sumer, at the same early date is this large corpus of religious texts where they can actually tell us in their own words what they believed, why they believed it, and what they thought it all meant. So if you want to know kind of the origins of your own traditions and religion, this is where you go. Not only that, the Greeks claimed, and they believed. I mean, we try to trace, we like to trace our, you know, enlightenment philosophy and, and modern civilization back to the Greeks because they, they gave us democracy and they gave us philosophy and Plato and Aristotle. But if you read the Greeks, they were newcomers on the stage and they traced their stuff back to Egypt. And so if you asked a Greek where civilization came from, they would say Egypt because they were Egyptian wannabes. And they say that the Egyptians taught them to build in stone. The Egyptians taught them how to run a good government. The Egyptians taught them these things. They didn't make it up themselves. They learned it from the Egyptians. So uh, Egypt is where it's at. So presumably this is a religion class. I, I know this class, I'm going to spend a little time on history. I'm going to spend a little time on teaching people to read Egyptian 
um, and that'll all be fun. Uh, but I'm going to start with religion, and I think the best way to give you an introduction to Egyptian religion that will then influence kind of everything we do after that is uh, to start with Stephen Prothero. Now, if, if some of you saw my talk um, on religious differences and how to deal with the fact that religions are different and what, what they're different in, and how to see and kind of pinpoint the core of their differences, then um, this is from that. And I won't go through it all again, but I want to remember, remind ourselves of the idea. And that is, Stephen suggests that each religion presents a problem. Every single human on the planet recognizes that something is wrong. Um, I think it's because our biology has programmed us to want the world to be a certain way, because that will help us you know, succeed and procreate and have family and friends and people we love. But reality has created a world that is very different from the world we want. So we want to live forever with our loved ones and they die and we're sad because everyone dies. We get old, our joints hurt, we get arthritis, we get tired, we can't run anymore. Um, our friends die, our houses burn down. This stuff happens. The world is not as we want it to be. So there's a problem. And every single human society has recognized that there is a problem. The problem, and the this is where differences come in. Religions are different because they each propose that the problem is different. Whereas they each see a different problem. The Buddhists think the problem isn't with the world, and as long as you think the problem is with the world, you'll be frustrated because you can never fix it. The problem is with our reaction to the world. If we stop being so sad when these things happen, they wouldn't be so bad. It, it's something in our head that's wrong, not something out there that's wrong. And if we can change our head, we can fix it. And not that we don't want to you know, also change the world, but, but we want to react to the inevitable bad parts of the world differently, because some parts of it are inevitable. However, if you're a Christian, the problem is sin. That, that we've all broken the commandments of God. And all the suffering in the world comes down to the fact that, that from original sin and our own sins, and as a root of original sin and our own sin, the world has gone off in a direction other than the one we want and other than the one God wants. And the solution is repentance, and repentance is made possible by Jesus. So they all disagree, not only on what the problem is, but then they disagree on what the solution is, and then they all have different techniques for implementing the solution, and then they all come up with different exemplars who have implemented the solution to teach us how to implement the solution. So that's kind of one of the ways you can see the differences in religion. Now, if I apply this to Egypt, which is where I'm headed, Egyptians see the problem as isfit, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute. They see the solution as ma'at, and the techniques for achieving it are their religion, their ritual, their magic, mummification, government, pharaohs, all of that, and their exemplars are, of course, the gods that they'll tell myths about, and the pharaohs, who are the, the incarnations of the gods on the earth. So we can apply that to the Egyptians, and once we do, it creates a framework in which we can see all the different things that we're going to go through and how they fit into this larger picture. Yeah. It's the samsara. Samsara. It's the cycle of rebirth, death, rebirth, that, that Hindus believe is the problem. The problem is we're stuck here being born again and again and again, and we'd like to escape uh, to nirvana from samsara. Okay. So what is isfit? Um, there's, there, if I was a physicist trying to describe this, now the Egyptians never would have done it this way because they didn't understand in these terms these problems, but as a physicist I would call isfit entropy. The problem with the world is entropy. But the Egyptians would have described it as death, decay, chaos, and injustice. And all those things are the same thing. Lies and untruths and injustice and chaos, decay, and entropy is the problem with the world. The problem is, isn't that we've sinned. The problem is that we die. The problem is that we decay. So if death is the problem, eternal life is the solution. And death is just one more face of isfit, or um, you know, just, just decay. So I found this neat artistic representation of kind of urban decay, 
but that's that's exactly what they would have seen as the problem. So now, you, again, I want to I want to do this so we get a framework for where we're headed. But it's worth just kind of glimpsing ahead for a minute. Do you see why they built in stone now? They, why did they build in stone? Why did they make pyramids that were designed to last forever? They're fighting ISFIT and trying to create something that will last in a world where nothing lasts because ISFIT is the problem. All right. So what's the solution? The solution is Ma'at. And of course, like most things, the Egyptians personified Ma'at as a goddess. But Ma'at isn't just this, this goddess who is the solution. Ma'at is a concept that she embodies. Ma'at, if Isfit is um, chaos, Ma'at is order. If Isfit is uh, injustice, Ma'at is justice. She's almost always shown with this uh, feather on her head. Um, the feather is the symbol of, of truth, justice, in the Egyptian way. Um, and on the right is how we spell her name, and you can always spell it lots of different ways, and we haven't taught you to read this stuff yet, so um, that's less important than, than um, one element of that, which I'll show you in a minute. The first is the feather. If you look at how her name is spelled, it often has the feather, the feathers on her head. It's either her name is actually can just be written as the feather, or some phonetic ma to person with a feather, right? Um, so this feather shows up here, here, everywhere we look. Uh, and I want to show, this is the Egyptian judgment scene, where a person is being judged for how they lived their life. And the way they're judged is their heart is placed here on a scale, and the feather is placed on this scale. Now, you often hear this described in pop culture. We want to see if your heart is light as a feather. But that's not it. If your heart is lighter than the feather, you get eaten by the crocodile. If your heart is heavier than the feather, you get eaten by the crocodile. What you want is to balance the feather because this is truth, this is justice, and you want to match justice. You want to be just in all your ways, not go too far, too, too less. You want to be right there. And if you do that, you get to go on and meet Osiris, become Osiris, and live forever. If you don't do that, you get eaten by this night crocodile guy here. And of course, this guy is taking notes. If you succeed, he writes your name in the Book of Life. We're going to see all sorts of things, by the way, that I'm not going to necessarily point them out in great detail, but a lot of these things will sound familiar to Christian um, religious traditions and Jewish religious traditions. There's definitely borrowing going on. But here we have the Book of Life, and he's going to write their name in the Book of Life if they pass this test. Otherwise, they eat. If they pass, they get to stand before Osiris. His face is unfortunately missing. But this is Osiris and uh, his sister Isis uh, and Neph. I can never say this person. Nephthys. 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 There we go. Nephthys is also his sister, but he's married to Isis, and Nephthys is his um, other sister that married Set, who we'll talk about later. So behind him are the two sisters who helped him be resurrected. Here he is, a resurrected being. You stand before him and get to be resurrected and live forever, just like he is resurrected and lived forever. And um, there's also some, some, some similarity I see, at least, to Christianity, where Christ died and was raised, and because he came back to life, we can come back to life. Well, in this case, because Osiris came back to life, we can come back to life. But what I want you to see is the bottom of this throne. You see this stone? This stone, with a certain shape, is the stone upon which Osiris's throne is set. And that stone is called the Mott Stone. And of course, that stone is the same stone you see here, and here, and here. That is the Mott Stone. Again, it's truth, justice in the Egyptian way. The solution to the problem. And of course, to, to establish your throne on Mott, you can, you can imagine all the, the kind of implications that would have to the Egyptian mind, right? We judge according to truth. Our throne is established in eternities via truth. Of course, it's, it's the same idea we saw with the feather. Let's see, I want you to see it a couple ways. The feather and the stone. The stone has a certain implication. The feather has this idea of truth, balance, right? Because you've got to balance your heart against it. The stone is this stable thing. It's about the, the stability 
of the idea. So one part of the concept is the is the balance part of, of, of it and the truth part. And the other part of it is the stability. The con the, 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 the opposite of the entropy, you see. Um, the other way you establish Mott is not all puppies and happiness and, and, and goodness. Um, because the Egyptians understood, as by the way we sometimes forget, that evil exists in the world. And of course the problem is, as soon as you define evil in the world, you recognize that evil must be confronted, sometimes with force. Uh, the trick is, that it's really easy to define anything that's not you as the evil and then go out and face it with force, which the Egyptians did on a, on a regular basis. But the concept, at least, is that sometimes we establish truth and justice by going out and physically opposing injustice. And that was the Pharaoh's job, and that was the job of the military, and that was what they were there for. And so often the Egyptians would see Ma'at is being established when the pharaoh went out, gathered up all the enemies of, of the land who were, who were causing problems in Egypt and smited them. So you'll see these scenes on almost every temple wall of the pharaoh with his mace raised, about to smite his enemies, which he's holding by the hair almost always, uh, kneeling before him. And this scene is one of the oldest in, in Egyptian history. One of the earliest pieces of Egyptian art to depict a pharaoh shows this scene. And one of the latest scenes in Egyptian art to depict a pharaoh depicts this scene. He's, and it's the same scene from time immemorial. The pharaoh with a mace, always a mace, smiting his enemies. This was again seen with, for, for good or bad as one of the ways to establish Mott. And that's how it was done. So going back to that kind of eternal idea, this one is from Tutankhamun's tomb. And you can tell because right here in the cartouche, we have two talk. Um, so let's see. What this says is this hieroglyph, and actually I think I just read this wrong. That's his second name. But anyway, this um, this hieroglyph is D, means to, to give. And who, who knows what this one is? Ankh, what does Ankh mean? Life. So, so given life. So to, to talk common is given life. This hieroglyph is phonetic, jet, and then there's a picture of the earth with three dots under it, and that means the earth. Or it doesn't mean the earth, but, but the earth is, has to do with the meaning of the term. And this one is the sun, nehet. These are phonetic on either side, and then there's the sun, nehet. So what does that mean? He's given life, jet, nehet. Um, nehet is usually translated in English as time, and jet is, I'm um, um, sorry, is eternity, and jet is usually translated as time. The other way around. Nehet is time, jet is eternity. Um, but neither of those terms really match. Um, this is the Egyptian goal, is to have given life for time and eternity, as eternal life is the goal. Um, we always think of Egypt, by the way, as, as obsessed with the mummy and the grisly mummy in the tomb, but Egypt is obsessed with eternal life, not eternal death, trying to overcome death. Nehet and Jet, the ideas are, uh, so for us, uh, time is this thing that moves forward, right, and, and is linear, and eternity is this thing that doesn't change. Um, the Egyptians saw it as, um, they didn't believe in this linear time that we do, so uh, Nehet has this picture of the sun in the middle. What it means is recurrence. So it's time that recurs. The seasons, eternal, year after year after year, the seasons come and they go and they return and, and death, rebirth, death, rebirth, the winter, the summer, things die, they're born for eternity. So both of these things live inside of you know, our time, but one expresses this concept of recurrence within time, but recurrence that never ends, never ending recurrence. The other one represents stability that doesn't change. So some things change, some things don't. Um, so for example, the earth, the rock, that's why they built out of stone. I keep coming back to that, right? And that's why the determinant here at the bottom of this, this th these two are phonetic. This part isn't phonetic, but it means it's the earth, it's the stability, it's the rock, the bedrock that doesn't change, the sun that comes and goes every day for time and eternity. I mean, those are, we really don't have a way to translate that in English, but 
This is a phrase that's written on almost every tomb wall, on every pharaoh's door, on every, you know, give me life, give me strength, give me stability for time and eternity. And in fact, I like this idea so much, my wedding ring has written on the inside of it in Egyptian hieroglyphics, Heidi and James uh, for time, our, our Nehet Jet for time and eternity. Uh, inside of my wedding ring, I had, had the people who made my ring inscribe it. I that was really neat. So um, another, another um, example of Isfit and Mot uh, comes from the dung beetle. So we've all seen Egyptian scarabs, right? You know, they have these little amulets with, with these beetles on them. You ever wonder what the beetles are all about? Well, these are the beetles they were talking about. They're called dung beetles. And the reason the Egyptians thought these guys were cool is because they would wander around and they would roll these big balls of poop. <laughs> and it kind of looked like, you know, the sun rolling across the sky. And that, that part was neat too, right? But it got even neater because after rolling these big balls of poop, a new beetle would come out of the poop. And, and they didn't, they, didn't uh, they were not very good biologists. They didn't realize that a male beetle was even involved in the process. And, and they didn't realize that the female beetle had laid eggs in the poop. All they knew is that she would scoop together a big ball of poop and babies would come out of it. And that was pretty cool. And the reason that's cool is because poop is the best example of this fit you can possibly imagine. Right? I mean, it just, it is. I mean, think about it. You take wonderful banquet of nice, wonderful food, you eat it, and out comes poop. And that's entropy, dang it. Right? And these beetles took entropy and made new life out of it. Even better, they were associated with the sun because they, Egyptians believed the sun died in the evening and was born again in the morning. Death and birth, you notice that Christ is resurrected at the rising of the sun. So the sun dies and then it's born again in this cycle of death and rebirth. <laughs> and the dung beetle is this amazing symbol of that. It's even better because it's a play on words, because the word for in Egyptian for uh, beetle, hepper, happens to also be the Egyptian word to exist. So, so if you're going to die, but then you, you, know, you cease to exist, but if you're, if you're resurrected, you get to exist again. So your existence is, is guaranteed through the cycles of death and rebirth through these scarab beetles. We'll talk more about amulets in a bit. Um, <clears throat> Here's another example. These are called hypocyphilis. And what happens here is you put this big round thingy. It's the best way to describe it. It's a big round thingy. And you put it under the head of the mummies. And on it, it references a spell from the Book of the Dead, which says, you know, may a flame appear under his head and may, he, may, uh, may warmth and life return to his body. It, it's a spell to warm you up again. You know, corpses get cold and you get warmed up again. And it's round because it's a symbol of the sun. It's put under your head because halos, I mean, come on, right? And, and it, it glows and it makes you all warm and you come back to life. It's part of the resurrection kit of the dead pharaoh or the dead person. And it's solar. You see the monkeys. By the way, the, this, is, this is the Egyptian hieroglyph for praise, which is what these monkeys are doing, right? Their hands up raised. And what, what this comes from is when the sun rises, there just happens to be some monkeys that live in Egypt who would raise their hands to the sun and chatter. Tee -tee 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 -tee. They always did this when the sun raised because they, uh, presumably they're warming their hands or I don't know exactly what they're doing, but they do this. And the Egyptians thought that they were worshiping the sun, so that's pretty cool. So you have these monkeys worshiping the sun, and you have the boats at the top which carry the sun across the blue sky because the sky is blue because it's made out of water, naturally. And it's born on one side of this thing, comes around the other side, dies. You notice everybody here is upside down, and their feet are together because they're mummies. Up here, their feet are apart because they're, they're alive. So if the sun is born, sails across the sky, goes into the netherworld, dies. These are the sons of Horus. These are all um, associated with death. And then you come back up the other side, and you're born again. And so this, this is the cycle of the sun through the sky. So oh, that was a whirlwind tour of Egyptian religion. Um, and we'll do details, right? I want to go through the pyramid text. I want to go through the coffin text. I want to go through the Book of the Dead. And we'll do all these details. But once, once you've seen the big picture, you can fit it. You can fit the details in and see where they, where they match and how they have to do with the problem, the solution, and the way the solution is implemented.
Okay, so the other thing we have to do, though, to lay a groundwork for talking about the specifics is we really just have to talk about, you know, the, the boring stuff, which is the history and the geography. And frankly, that's not the most exciting part for me. But what it does is it provides a context in which you see the other events, just like the introduction of religion did. So I want to start with, you know, just Egypt, Egypt is sitting right here at the top of Africa, right? so geography. It's got this river that runs through it called the Nile. Uh, the Egypt has been called many times, from ancient times, in fact, the gift of the Nile. And that's fairly literal because every year the Nile floods. And the reason it floods is because the source of the Nile down here um, is subject to monsoons once a year. So when those monsoons hit, the, the, the Nile floods. The Egyptians don't see the rain. I mean, it, just, it doesn't rain in Egypt in the middle of a rain shadow. And so they don't see the rain. All they know is that the river starts flooding. And I want you to figure out, see, I want you to imagine what the flooding Nile was like to the Egyptians living on its banks. The water rises. It turns red. That's the first thing that happens. The reason it turns red is because it's gathering all this silt from upstream and, and churning it downstream at a very rapid rate as it rushes down and it turns red. And then later on it turns green. The green is associated with Osiris. And, and the green growing plants and things. But it turns green because it's picking up, you know, algae and, and plants and, and kind of washing all the grass away <laughs> from upstream. And it comes down, and then once it gets down here, it slows down because it comes down these hills down here, and that's where it picks all this stuff up. And it comes down here and it, and it slows down and it drops all that right black and red silt and plant material and dumps it on Egypt in, in a floodplain, a wide, wide floodplain. And then the water recedes, goes back to its regular banks, and the Egyptians come back home to brand new rejuvenated topsoil that they then plant their crops on. So this let Egypt grow more food than it needed. In fact, the Romans called Egypt kind of their breadbasket. Egypt would feed Rome in later days. The food for Rome was grown in Egypt. But Egypt could grow more food than it needed, and what that meant is that it could have people who weren't contributing to the agricultural economy. They could do other things like be a priest and specialize in religion. So Egypt gets a complicated religion. Or they can be a scribe. Or they can be a member of an army. So Egypt can create a standing army. Or they can be a bureaucrat. Or, dang it, they can build a pyramid. Or better yet, while Egypt is flooded for three months, everybody can build a pyramid. And so the... Um, the geography of Egypt plays a role in Egypt's prosperity and in the work projects it, it produces. Um, to keep the crops watered after the floods receded, they actually did irrigation projects that would then get washed away often during the floods at the end of the year. They had to build them again. And so they had big communal work projects that got them used to building things together. Like they could it created a bureaucracy to build this stuff that would then enable things like the pyramids. The other thing that was great about it is there's cataracts down here that make travel difficult. There's mountains, regions down here. There's a sea on this end. And on this end, there's a big desert. And on this end is a big sea. And Egypt is fairly well protected from its neighbors. Um, and Egypt will send expeditions to the south down here to gather gold. They will send expeditions to Lebanon to gather cedars and wood, because they're wood shy. But Egypt is filled with gold, but it doesn't come from Egypt. It comes from down here, the Nubians down south. And uh, they also had a rich supply of um, turquoise that they could mine from the Sinai. So this was where kind of the wealth of Egypt came from. And Egypt's, Egyptians were really lazy um, sailors. They are really bad at it, actually. Um, they don't sail well. And the reason they don't sail well is because the Nile made them lazy. It just so happens that, that the wind blows from lower Egypt towards upper Egypt. Now, I guess I should have defined those terms. I should have, should have done this. Um, we always think of north as the top of the map, but this is downhill and this is uphill. So this is what the Egyptians call upper Egypt and this is lower Egypt. So it's backwards. You have to kind of keep that. 
But the wind blows from Upper Egypt, or from Lower Egypt. See, I already get it backwards. From Lower Egypt towards Upper Egypt. So if you want to go south, you just put up your sails and sit back and let the wind take you south. Once you get south, you do your business. You want to go north, you just drop your sails and let the current take you that way. And so what that meant is they had really great communication. They had great ability to travel and send messages up and down the Nile. But once they hit the Wajwar, the Great Green, the Mediterranean Sea, they were out of their depth and often in trouble. Um, there's some great literature, the shipwrecked sailor, we'll have to tell you about, about a sailor who dared sail the Mediterranean and was shipwrecked on an island with a great serpent god, and it's cool. Um, they will, someday we'll tell you the story of the shipwrecked sailor. But, but the Egyptians aren't great sailors. So when, for example, the Philistines and the Sea People and the Greeks and the Mycenaeans come from the sea, they're outclassed in the north of the Mediterranean because these, sailing is just not something the Egyptians developed to the same degree as the Greeks would. For obvious reasons, the Greeks living in the middle of the Mediterranean on islands, they're the seafarers. Okay. There's another one fascinating uh, tidbit about, <coughs> about Egypt, and that's that the heat and the sand tended to dry out bodies naturally. So that caused them to believe two things. One, Egypt is special and magic. So you never wanted to die on foreign soil. You always wanted to be back and brought back and buried in Egypt because something about Egypt is magical and it preserves your body and will help you be resurrected in the next life. But it also caused them to say, well, can we do this even better than Egypt already does? And they started developing mummifications. This is where you know, mummification comes from. Part of that is, is derived from the geography of where they lived and how it was naturally happening anyway. And that will impact the religious belief about Egypt being special. Getting mummified and getting buried outside of Egypt didn't guarantee your resurrection in the same way being mummified and buried in Egypt did. So they were, they were Egypt first. Egypt best people. And then here's the chronology. Now I don't I don't care about the dates. I mean I do, but but they're not essential, they're not important. You don't have to memorize them. But what I want you to get out of the dates is they're big. There's a lot of time here. And I also want you to get an idea of relative chronology. Certain things happened before other things, and I want you to be able to kind of put them in order, and it doesn't matter if you have exact dates for them, but if you can get them in order, that's useful. So we have pre-dynastic period. Writing is developed near the end of that. Early dynastic period, that's our, our um, Narmer and, and Jet and some of these other kings. By the way, there's a king in the pre-dynastic period called the Scorpion King, which led to a really stupid movie. Um, <laughs> Yeah. So once you actually learn Egyptian history, the the, uh, the Egyptian movies that get produced become more and more humorous. Um, so anyway, there's this early dynastic period. Then there's the Old Kingdom. This is when things pick up. Egypt becomes great, and they build pyramids and sphinxes, and everything is cool. And then everything falls apart. And I want you to notice something. It falls apart for about 200 years. I mean. Things fall apart for about as long as the America has existed. I keep using that as a great example, but it is a good example. America has existed as a nation for about as long as Egypt wallowed trying to get its act back together. Now, that's a certain perspective because what happened, among other things, was that the officials became wealthy. They outclassed the pharaoh. The pharaoh's power diminished, and the, and the, um, the ministers were building bigger monuments than the pharaoh. And there were competing pharaohs, and, and kind of their, their, their government fell apart. But it's not clear to me that the average person was worse off in the intermediate period. That, but the pharaohs certainly were worse off. Um, and then the Middle Kingdom happened, and they made America great again, only they made Egypt great again. And, uh, and they, got a, they got a strong, powerful king again, which they wanted. I mean, they, they, there's, if you read the Lamentations, the Lamentations are fun, but there's a, there's a body of literature that's best compared to Lamentations in the Bible, and it's actually called the Lamentations, and it's usually written about how horrible things were in the Middle Kingdom, in the, in the first intermediate period. Just, everything was horrible, and aren't we glad we have a pharaoh again? Because now things are great. So there's our, our, our Middle Kingdom. This is where Hatshepsut and this stuff happens. 
Then we have the second intermediate period, things fall apart again. And then we have the New Kingdom, this is where we get to Moses, Ramses, uh, uh, etc. And then we have a third intermediate period, and then everything really goes to heck, and it just stays to heck. And um, I want you to tie this to other stories. I, you know, again, not everyone here is a, is a um, there's a lot of people from any face in this audience, um, but a lot of us came from a Judeo-Christian background. So tying it into the Bible, I think, helps in that sense. We've heard those stories before. Well, the reason David and Solomon get to exist is because Egypt has fallen apart. Egypt traditionally controlled that area, and it all happens down in here. And the reason it can happen, the reason David and Solomon are allowed to exist is because Egypt has fallen apart. In fact, um, in Isaiah, um, God, presumably speaking, calls Egypt a broken reed upon which if you lean, it will pierce your hand. What it means is, you know, you've got a reed, normally you'd use a reed for a staff to, to hold yourself up, but Egypt is broken, and sometimes when you break a staff, it becomes sharp. And if you put your hand on it, it will go right through your hand. So don't lean on Egypt, it won't work. Because Egypt is, is a broken reed. That's the way they describe Egypt at this time. And this is when Assyria and Babylon get their act together, become the real problems for Israel. Eventually Assyria and Babylon will try to conquer that area, and Israel will appeal to Egypt to help. And Egypt will try and not be very successful. And at some point, Assyria will conquer Egypt. Then Babylon will conquer Egypt. And then the Persians will conquer Egypt. And then the Greeks will conquer Egypt. And Egypt stops kind of ruling itself during this time period. Uh, and when the Greeks conquer Egypt, that enters what we call the, the Ptolemaic period. Um, because Ptolemy was one of the generals of Alexander the Great who conquered the world, and he was given Egypt after Alexander died, and they married into the royal line of, of the pharaohs who had come before, trying to legitimize their rule, but they never learned Egyptian, they spoke, they spoke Greek, Greeks, but they were, they were kind of a continuation of Egyptians sort of ruling themselves, and Cleopatra was the last. And Cleopatra is actually an interesting character because she, she, she actually decides that Egypt is kind of cool, I guess is maybe the way to describe it. And she, she went out and, and, and worships the Egyptian god and seems to believe and actually become devout. She um, learns to speak Egyptian instead of just speaking Greek. And uh, she was almost kind of, it seemed like she was on the road to kind of reinvigorating Egyptian culture and the Romans squash it. And from that moment on, Egypt is not ruled by anyone even remotely related to Egyptian, to the Egyptian royal line from that moment on. And, um, and then that kind of lasts with different people in control until um, the Christians come. And the Egyptians will convert to Christianity in droves until the time comes when no one can read Egyptian hieroglyphs anymore. They're still speaking Egyptian, but they can't read the hieroglyphs because they've started writing in Greek the Christians compared the hieroglyphs to, to um, paganism and devil worship. So you can speak Egyptian, but you've got to write it in Greek. So they started writing the Greek, the, the Egyptian words in Greek letters. And um, until about 400 AD, when the last Egyptian priest writes upon a wall with Egyptian hieroglyphs, and it disappears. And for another about... 1,500 years, no one can read these inscriptions on these walls. So that brings me, of course, to Egyptian writing. And <clears throat> I know this is supposed to be a religion class, but I can't help myself. I love hieroglyphics, so i got to talk about this. This is so neat. <laughs> you know, last, when we talked about prehistory, one of the main big evolutionary leaps happened when people invented the ability to speak. And I talked about what a miracle it is that I can say these words, you can hear them and understand what I'm talking about. So I want to go through that one more time. Just, just picture it for just a minute. There's an idea in my head, and that idea has something to do with a bunch of neurons firing in certain patterns. And, and this pattern of neurons, somehow that we don't understand, makes an idea in my head. And I, that idea is I have this cat. And dang it, I love my cat. My cat is cute. 
Okay, so I've got a cute cat, and it's an idea in my head. And somehow I translate all, the, all that pattern of firing neurons into some movements of my lips that make this sound vibration waves in the air, and I speak the words, cats are cute. Okay. And there's this guy over there, and he has this thing called an ear, right? And he hears those vibrations. And those vibrations hit his eardrum and sends neural signals to his brain, and his brain starts firing in a bunch of patterns. And he thinks, this cat is too sexy for its fur, and isn't it cute? And you'll notice something about this. The idea that appeared in his brain is not the same as the idea that was in my brain. There's a translation problem, and sometimes we don't communicate very well because of it. But the fact that we can do it at all is a miracle. It's really a miracle. And the reason it works, among other things, is because we have shared experience with cute cats. We have a shared biology that thinks certain things are cute, and we have certain experience seeing cats and thinking they're cute, and you put all that together and you get some idea of what I'm thinking when I make these sounds, because you can translate. I can translate from my thoughts to those sounds, and you can translate from those sounds to similar thoughts, because we have similar brains and similar lived experiences. And it depends on all that similarity and similarity of lived experience. It's the context. That's why reading ancient languages is hard, among other things. We lack some of the shared context that makes this work. So we have to put ourselves back in their lives and what their lives were like before we begin to understand what they're talking about. Okay, it's mind reading. <laughs> really what it is, it's this technique for reading each other's minds. It's amazing. Enter writing. Writing is the same thing, but somebody somewhere came up with the idea that if you just draw some pictures instead of moving your lips, I can do the same trick of sending a thought from my brain to your brain. But now I don't just send it from my brain to your brain, I send it from my brain to your brain through time and space. I can write a letter and ship it off to somewhere else, and you can read my words thousands of miles away and 5,000 years later. And we can pull this same trick off again, and we can do it years later. So this dead guy, Ramses II, can write something on a wall that happens to be W. You. I mean, it's great. That's the word for cat. I love it. Okay, so this guy can write these symbols and then draw a picture of a cat, of course, just to make it obvious what I'm talking about. And this guy, Jan Asman, a famous Egyptologist, living you know thousands of years later, can go, oh yeah, cat. And he may be thinking of a different cat than Ramses was when Ramses wrote the word cat, but it's close. And that's a miracle. So writing is a miracle. Where did they come up with the idea? I mean, we have this idea that somebody somewhere just had an aha moment. All I have to do is write this down, and it, it, it just magically happens, right? But when we look at the development of writing, it doesn't happen that way. It's not like someone just realized this fact and suddenly it just started happening. It, it happened slowly. People made baby steps, and then they took steps backwards, and then they made a few more progress. And they, they moved. So they started out drawing pictures. And these are little tags, sometimes written in, in, I think, pottery, but sometimes in bone or um, clay or some other things. And on these things is drilled a hole and a picture. And what they're doing is they're labeling the stuff that's in jars. So they're labels. You can also keep track of how much people owe you. You owe me five, because they don't have money, so we're going to barter. So you owe me five bottles of beer. So I draw a little picture of five bottles of beer. In fact, you can see the numbering. Okay. You're keeping track of how many, those little indentations, and pictures that tell you what it is. And about halfway through this process, they stopped drawing, they, they realized they, they wanted to represent something that was really hard to draw a picture of. Like, this is red wine, not white wine. I mean, they probably don't have red and white wine, but okay. if I wanted to express that, it's hard to draw a picture. I can paint the picture, but, but let's say I just want to put an indentation. What do I do? And someone realized that I could draw a picture of a robin 
an elephant, and a dog, and then a picture of wine. Red wine. Robin, elephant, dog, R-E-D, red. So what's happening is, and, and even that realization doesn't happen right away. It happens slowly, where first it's cognates. Two words that say the same thing, that sound the same, but mean some, something different, like bank. So if I wanted to say I'm putting my money in the bank, I could draw a picture of a bank on a river, a river bank. What I mean is a money bank, right? That was the first realization. And then it went to kind of the next step where they put a couple of those together, and then you can spell things out. And then they said, well, what if this picture only represents the first sound? Because then it's easier, because there, there's not a lot of things that are cognates, that, that are, sorry, that's a word that just is R, right? Er. I would like a picture of er because if I have to use Robin, that's R-O-B, I just want the R, right? And then someone realized, well, I don't have to look for a word that just has an R, I can draw a picture of a robin, and it only means the R, just the first letter. So this doesn't happen overnight. And then even after they've got all the, I mean, once you get that way, you've got it. It's a magic. You can put the magic together, and you can start writing. And they don't do it. They've got all the magic pieces, and they label their, jar, their, their jars of beer for years and years. They have the magic tools, and they're labeling their jars. And then somebody starts writing, I mean really writing, and they take a sentence like they would speak it, and they put it out in big, long, verbose um, verbiage. And as soon as that happens, we start getting things like the pyramid texts. People take their religious thoughts. They have this complicated religious liturgy that they've been passing on by memory, and they write it down so they can pass it on. And so that they can remember in the next life, because it's a pain in the neck to remember the entire liturgy for how to live again after you die if you're the Pharaoh. You'd like to write it down so you can look it up if you forget, right? Um, and, and, and the magic happens. And, and, and it's religion, it's, it's economics that puts the pieces together, but it seems to be, as far as I can tell, religious texts that first start writing in more verbose sentences. It's, it's for, because of their religion that they take the step from labeling pots to writing, writing, to really writing. And once they did that, there's a couple things you can do. You can carve it on the walls, which we just saw, but they also invented paper, papyrus. Papyrus is the world's first paper, and I've, I've got some. And, and this is, you know, tourist papyrus um, that, that, that I grabbed while I was in Egypt and, and drew my own hieroglyphs on, and you can tell my handwriting stinks, and that's all right. But um, like I said, it, it's, it's tourist, it's not ancient, it's you know made a few years ago, but they make it the same way. It's the same stuff. And so this is what the Egyptians created when they invented paper. This is the world's first paper, and we can now write, now if you're, if you're in Mesopotamia, you write on clay tablets, and so their writing doesn't becomes these little chicken scratches with, with the little stylus that you push into the clay and then you bake the clay tablet. If you're in Egypt, you're carving on stone, and the religion pushes them in that direction, and they invent paper, so they start drawing on, um, drawing things on paper with pens and brushes. Um, I'm going to um, step down for a minute and pass this around so you can kind of feel what this stuff is like. It's a lot you know, more thick and, and, and hard than the paper we're used to. And you you haven't, some of you have probably seen this stuff, but if you haven't, you can play with it. Hold on a sec. Make sure everyone gets to play with the paper. Okay, so you know, the way they did this is they cut these strips off of these reeds called papyrus. They lay them out in kind of a grid pattern. They pound them flat and then they dry them out and, um, and you end up with papyrus. And they write very complicated scripts on them. And you notice this stuff doesn't look quite the same as what you just saw. What you just saw before was, you know, this writing on stone. And this looks, this is cursive. Let me do this in a minute. Egyptians had several scripts. They had what we call the hieroglyphic script, which is the stuff they, they drew on walls and painted on tombs and carved in stone. And they were works of art. Each letter was a unique work of art. 
They didn't use stencils. You can tell because every bird is unique. And each bird was a little unique work of art. Each foot was a unique work of art. That's the hieroglyphic stuff. Then they had heratic, which is best described as cursive. It looks like the birds, but it's, it's a very quick, um, and this is designed for papyrus. This is so you can write something on papyrus. And, and it sort of is meant to look similar. Like here's the, here's the wavy lines, and they draw less waves. Um, that's hard. So, so uh, heratic is, this is cursive. Cursive designed to make writing faster. Demotic is just, it, it, it almost loses its connection to the hieroglyphics. Um, and the cursive gets so abstract that you can't really uh, tell what, what it is supposed to be. But it's, and by the way, this is probably how we get letters. You know, real letters today aren't pictures of things anymore. They've lost all connection to the pictures they used to. And A used to be a picture of a bull, by the way. Um, and this has lost kind of all connection to the, to the pictures, and it's just become stylized over time. Demonic is um, it's Greek. It's not what the Egyptians called it, but it's from democratic, the same word. It's, it's the writing of the people. So a bunch of people would use this in writing in everyday usage, and then the priests would use this stuff when writing on temple walls. And, and they would also use this heretic when writing religious texts or papyrus. Um, so, how do we go from, from that? Now remember, no one knows, so I'm gonna go through this decipherment now. No one knows how to read this stuff. So I took this picture, this is the tomb of Teddy. There's this text on the wall, it's the second oldest religious text in existence. And how do you figure out what this means? What do you do? Well, what, first of all, people had to figure out what they were looking at. Um, and there was some debate. This is a page from Gardner's sign list. The first thing they did was they collected uh, all of the pictures and put them in a list. So they had a list of all the different pictures that could be used. And the first thing they realized is there's more than 26 of these things. And if you just kind of go through all the sounds humans can make, there's a lot more here than there are sounds people can make. So the obvious conclusion is this is pictographic writing, like Chinese. Right? One picture per word. That's how Chinese works. That was the thought. The problem is if you do the math, there aren't enough pictures here unless Egypt, Egyptian has a very um, starved vocabulary. Plus certain figures show up too often. So it really can't be pictographic. Um, and a few scholars realized that, but most didn't. And so most of the people who tried to, tr to um, crack this thought it was pictographic writing, and they were off in the wrong direction. They were off in the weeds, and they, they, they never made progress because they couldn't figure it out. So um, let me give you an example of, of someone. Um, what, there was an ancient Greek writer, and I actually don't remember who his name was, but there was a Greek writer who thought he, he started working on cracking Egyptian from, you know, maybe 680 or something, I don't remember the exact date, but this Greek writer was trying to crack Egyptian. So he, uh, he, he found something in the king's list, and he found out that whenever one king was followed by his successor, there would be this bird, and he said, aha, bird, this is a duck, and the duck means son. The reason the duck means son is because ducks are very protective of their children. No, the reason the duck means son is because you pronounce the duck saw, and that happens to be the Egyptian word for son. So, um, <laughs> right? But but he 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 didn't know that, <clears throat> and, and so he was lost. <clears throat> so again, this is the first problem. There's too many pictures, <laughs> and what do you do with all these pictures, and how do you make sense of it? Well, enter the the Rosetta Stone. The Rosetta Stone is not a very impressive monument. It's, it's, it's kind of not very useful, in fact, um, for most things, except it happened to be what let us crack Egyptian, so it became famous. It's a late text written during the Ptolemaic period where the Ptolemies um, gave the churches tax-exempt status. And they were very happy with him. And so they decided to write this text praising the Ptolemies for giving the temples tax-exempt status. Sounds like something that would happen today, doesn't it? Um, 
and they're praising him to high heavens. And, and it says in, 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 they do it in three languages, hieroglyphics, hieratic, and Greek. And the reason they do it in Greek is because the Ptolemies don't speak Egyptian. And they're trying to praise the Ptolemies and getting good with the king, and it would help if the king could read it. And it just so happens that at the bottom of the text, it says, this is the same text written three ways. So it tells you, not only are there three different scripts on here, they're um, the same text, and it tells you that. Um, now, by the way, there aren't three languages. There are two languages... Greek and Egyptian, and three scripts, because the Egyptian is written in Demotic. Sorry, it's not Heretic, it's Demotic. I don't know why I said that. It's Demotic and Hieroglyphics. So the Egyptian is written two scripts, and the Greek is written in a different language. So when they found this, they realized right away this was going to be the key. I mean, as soon as they do it, they got they dug it up. They could read the Greek, and they read the Greek, and they went, oh my gosh, this is going to be it. This will teach us how to read this stuff. Um, it was found, um, by the way, during uh, Napoleon's uh, failed attempt to conquer Egypt during the Napoleonic Wars. So here's the piece that was the first thing read. You'll often see drawings of this that simplify what happened here and I'm, uh, make it simpler than it actually is. But it just so happens that this, someone came up with the idea that, that um, I bet the kings are the ones written in this round circle thingy that they call the cartouche because it means a round circle thingy. Um, and they figured that the kings were probably, the, 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 this cartouches probably had the names of the kings inside of it. And the reason they figured that out was because the, the king's lists on the wall, you know, what, remember that Greek said the saw thing? Well, we would have cartouche, saw cartouche, saw cartouche, so-and-so the son of so-and-so the son of. So they kind of had an idea that the cartouches surrounded kings' names. Not everybody's names, not even the god's names, but the king's names. And so if this is the king's name, and it's right here on the tablet, if you go back to the Greek, we know that that name that far down the tablet should be Ptolemy. So that means this is a P-T-O-L-E-S. Ptolemaeus is actually how it's said. So if it's Ptolemaeus, Ptolemaeus. Well, then what the heck is this other stuff? Well, we just so happen to know that this means Ankh, life. And you already know that this is Jet, life eternal. Right? And then um, Hetep is pleased, Mary, uh, pleased, and, and uh, Mary is uh, love, or, or I'm not, yeah, see, now I'm, I'm, that's horrible, I can't figure that out. But the point is, it's Ptolemy's name with a bunch of titles uh, and given life stuff after it. And that was a hypothesis, and they said, well, is that right? Um, it turns out they found Cleopatra's name on a on a um, on an obelisk. It was not, and you often hear that the, this this was both from the um, from the Rosetta Stone. It's not. Cleopatra's name was on an obelisk, but they knew that she, the obelisk was one she built. It was a name there in a cartouche. They figured out oh, it's probably Cleopatra. Let's see, and they just put Cleopatra and told me. Now notice this is simplified. They took all the rest of the text out. You had to make the guess that the rest of the text wasn't part of his name. But if you take that out, simplify it like this, and you just line stuff up, you start noticing stuff. Like, here's an E and here's a Y. That's maybe deceptive, but maybe related. I don't know. But here's this O. Dang it, the O lines up and the L lines up. And this doesn't line up, but you know what? Cleopatra was actually Cleopatra. So that's probably a D, not a T. Uh, and... The P is a really big aha moment because the P is right where it belongs. And so somebody at some point said, hey, we're on the right track. I can pronounce this stuff. So now I can go to the temple wall, and if I spend some time figuring out what each letter is, I can go to the temple wall and I can start reading it and pronouncing stuff. But how does that let me translate stuff? Intercoptic. Remember how I told you that the Greeks, uh, that the Christians, still spoke Egyptian in Egypt, but they made you write the Egyptian in Greek, but we can read the Greek. Better yet, there are dudes over there who still speak Coptic. And in fact, if you go to Coptic mass, do it sometime, you get to hear ancient Egyptian spoken. Because it's not perfect still, things have evolved, it has evolved, but because it's a dead language, mostly dead, and because it's a it's a religious liturgy like the mass, like when you did the mass in Latin, if you're Roman, well, they did the mass in 
Egyptian and it was frozen and they tried to preserve it and they're still pronouncing this stuff the way the Egyptians pronounce it. You can hear Egyptian spoken if you go to a Coptic mass. So it just so happens that if you can speak Egyptian, I'm sorry, if you can speak Coptic and you can figure out what the letters are and you can read the letters and you can put all that together and my um, battery is complaining that it's dying but it should be charging. Um, so, if you put all that together, uh, am I plugged in? I should be. Yeah, I'm probably using more power faster than it's charging. Let me let me quick this finish this up because it's going to sit and um, bounce it. I don't know how to turn that off once it starts doing that. Yeah, it says it's charging, but it's it's dying faster than it's charging. I'm going to have to turn some stuff off, but I can't. I've got everything running here I need, including my stream. All right. If you can, if you can do that, you go, to the, you go to the tombs, you start pronouncing the stuff as the letters tell you to pronounce it, and out comes words that are Coptic. And you know what they mean because they're Coptic, at least some of them. And the ones you don't know what they mean, you, you study them very carefully and put them in context until you figure it out. How to read it. This is the unilateral signs, so you can take those and turn your name into Egyptian if you wanted. This is why it's harder than that, right? These are the bilateral, bilateral signs. I wonder if there's a way to just turn that notice off until, until it dies on me. Maybe I can make it till it dies. Okay. Okay, so we have these bilateral signs. And what this are is two, two sounds. So, for example, if, if I want to write an H followed by an R, har, um, I draw a picture of a face. So, in other words, I've got a single H. I've, what's that? Okay. I've got a single H and I've got a single R. Uh, I could write the, the letter H and the letter R, but if I want to write them together, I can do that. So HR, and that's why there were too many pictures, right? Remember how the, they thought it might be pictographic because there were too many? But the reason there are too many is because they have this letter for H, this letter for R, and this letter for H when it's followed by an R. Or this letter for H and R together, but usually they'll write the R just in case you missed it. But, but this is an H when followed by an R, this is a an H alone when it's not followed by an R. And usually you don't, you know, shorten by just writing the HR, you write the H and then you write the R. So I can go to the next one. I've, um, then we get these determinants. Determinants sit at the end of a word and they just kind of classify the word. Like it would be like if we put an N at the end of every word if it was a noun and a V at the end of every word if it was a verb. Although they're not really parts of speech. They more kind of tell you this is a word having something to do with wind. This is a word having something to do with um, with scrolls or text. They're not they're not pictures that uniquely correspond to words, but they just tell you this is a word having to do with this concept or that concept. Example of how you write a word. The the first so this is an entry from a dictionary, and it's got these letters right here and then how to transliterate it and what it means. It means interior. It's an H, but it's only an H when followed by an N, and it's actually a, a picture of a, um, an animal skin that's been stretched out to turn into leather, and it's the H when followed by an N. But then they wrote the N, that's the, the little wavy lines under it. And then there's a, there's a jar, see the little jar, the third symbol? That's a new pot, that's an N when followed by a W. So we have an H, N, and then an N, and then they have the N again that's when followed by a W, and then they have a W, which is the chick. H, N, N, W, W, right? When all they're really writing is Henu, which means interior. Then they have a determinant that's a, a picture of a building, which says this, could, this has something to do with being inside or outside or around the building. It's almost like preposition, right? Henu, interior. So this is complicated stuff, and it's easy to simplify, which is what the Phoenicians did, right? When the Phoenicians created the phonetic alphabet we have today, it's a simplified alphabet. 
26 letters, 26 cents, really easy. Literacy goes through the roof. A lot more people can read once you get phonetic writing. The Egyptians didn't want that. They're very well aware that they can simplify their alphabet, and they don't want to, because their alphabet is an art style. It's an art form, and it's beautiful. And it's intended to be beautiful and difficult and challenging. And it also gives you great um, job security if you happen to be a scribe. <laughs> but it's not easy, and it's not supposed to be. So what I wanted to do is if we could find a piece of paper, and we probably don't have time for this, because um, I'm running out of time. But um, when you get home, do this. So go home and, and look up the Egyptian alphabet and forget all the biliterals and all the hard stuff and just find the literals and write your name. And I, I actually want you all to do this if you can. I mean, it's, it's not hard, but, but you really ought to get to do this. Because if I write mine, it's, I got this J, which is a snake, and then an A for A. And by the way, the Egyptians would have left the alphabet. The, the Egyptian is written without vowels. But there are vowels on here. It's because this is actually kind of a touristy sort of writing of the, of the letters. The A is actually, if you're familiar with Hebrew, it's an olive. It's a glottal stop. Um, because my name James has no glottal stop, you would actually leave the A out if you wanted to write it the way the Egyptians did. But who cares about that? I mean, the Ptolemies didn't even care about that. They started putting the stuff in as if it was a vowel. So I'm going to do that. So, so it'd be a snake. And then I get a rock, I got to draw this bird. And then there's an owl. J-A-M, right? And then E is easy. It's this little uh, feather reed thing. Um, and then S, I get to write a draw a bolt of cloth. That's easy. But try to draw that bird for a minute. I mean, right? <clears throat> this is a fun little exercise. Just, just do it. It's fun. Write your name, and then you'll have it, and, and you'll be proud of yourself. And, and even more than that, you'll get a feel for what it was like to, to, to have to create a work of art to, to write a word. A single word is a, is a work of art. And the way this would actually work is when you're all done writing your name, you draw a picture of a person. Because you're telling them that these letters uh, aren't just letters, they're a person. There's a person with this name. And if you want to pretend you're a king or a queen, you can draw a cartouche around it. Okay, magic. This is going to be the last subject. Now, I said we were going to get to the pyramid text and we were going to go through, you know, the, the, the first um, the, the pre-dynastic time and all that, we're not going to get to any of that stuff. And that's fine. I started putting this class together and I realized I'm going to give about half of the stuff I put in the email will happen in this class. The other half will have to happen next class. It just became obvious as I put this together that this isn't going to work. So I do want to talk about magic, though. Now, I've already talked about religion, but I'm going to talk about magic in Egypt. And what is the difference between magic and religion? Well, frankly, there is no difference. Um, but we tend to differentiate as people, just because we, we do. Um, but it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Um, the differences we, we claim to see don't make a lot of sense. Um, imagine, so what, 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 what really tends to happen is people will label anything that they, they, they think is superstitious as magic, and they will label anything that they think is beautiful religion as religion. So if I'm translating the Coptic mass, I would say the liturgy for transforming the bread. That's how I would translate it. In Egyptian, we have this, um, this text that actually just says the R. In Egyptian, it's R. R means the words. For is the Egyptian word is R. Uh, and it's the words for opening the doors of heaven. And how do you choose to translate that? Well, almost every book on Egyptian religion will translate that to spell. The spell for opening the doors of heaven. And what they've done is they've said that's magic. Right? But this is a liturgy that Egyptians would see no different than the Christian mass. And so the difference between a liturgy and a spell is whether you like it. <laughs> People try to make a distinction that, that has something more concrete and objective to it, and they'll say, well, Religion is about, you know, belief in God and who you worship and, and prayer, and magic is about trying to get a person to fall in love with you. I, you want something. I want to curse you, or I want to bless you, or I want to, right? But this spell for opening the doors of heaven, that's a, that has nothing to do with trying to make a love spell. This is trying to 
worship God. This is a, a liturgy for their worship of their God. And how many of you have heard a Christian pray that someone will fall in love with them? Did they just stop practicing religion and start practicing magic? It, it, the distinction makes no sense. Um, but, but, but we have to talk about um, how it was that the Egyptians felt like the rituals they performed and the liturgies they performed could impact the world. And I'll describe that as Egyptian magic without, even though the distinction is, doesn't make a lot of sense. And we'll try to make sense of Egyptian magic in that context. Um, the first principle of Egyptian magic is to make it happen, you say it. To say it is to make, the word is the deed. To make it happen, you say it. Um, the power of words for tran being transformed into lotus. Oh, sorry, the words or the ritual or the, or the, the recitation for um, being transformed into a lotus. Oh, lotus belonging to the semblance of Nefertum. I am the man. I know your name. I know your names. You gods, you lords of the realm of the dead. So th these are words that you say that have a magical outcome when you are in the land of the dead. Um, notice the reference to names. Egyptians would actually sometimes name their children multiple things. They would have a secret name that no one knew, and then they would have the real name that everyone called them. So, so if I name you Harry, um, but I call you Tom, then if someone tries to curse you, they will try to curse Tom, but Tom isn't your real name, so it won't work. So, so knowing the name of the thing is related to having the ability to impact the thing. In fact, Isis is called she who knows all the names. There's a great myth where Isis, that when one version she actually fights with Ra, or another version maybe she's there to heal him or something. And but either way, she makes a deal with him, says, I won't let you go or I won't heal you, whichever version you're reading, unless you tell me your name. And he tells him his, her name, he tries the spell, it doesn't work. And she keeps going through until he tells her his real name. And then Isis knows the name. Once Isis knows the name, she has the power. Isis is the one who resurrects Osiris because she is the goddess of magic. She is the one who knows all the names and is therefore has power over life and death and can bring people back to life or whatever, or heal people if they come and pray to her for healing or whatever it is because she knows the secret names of all things. Now that sounds kind of silly maybe, but I want you to recognize that a name is a symbol for something, right? I mean, there's that magic. I say those words, cat, and you have the idea, cat. It, the word is magic. It's a it's a a symbol for something that tries to capture the thing and put it in a in a symbol. And and that's really magic. That's impressive stuff. Um, and and this same idea works its way into Hebrew myth, which I couldn't resist pointing out. Uh, and God said, "Let there be light." And and I was like, right? The word is the deed. Um, this is a this is a central principle of Egyptian magic. And the word was made flesh, and it's also it's also um, finds its way to Christianity potentially. I think how you interpret that? Egyptians also had these. Um, I, they're sometimes called bone knives, but um, I think the best description is magic wand. I mean, really. Uh, and, and you would do things like draw a sacred circle around things. So, so say you didn't want to be bitten by a scorpion, you take this bone rod with this sacred spells written on it, and you draw a circle around around the bed, and then that would protect you from the scorpions. And circling things was really important to the Egyptians. They wrote their names in cartouches of the kings to protect the king's name from any untoward use of the name to curse the king. Um, and and there were rituals where the king would. Um, make a little model of the nation, and he would symbolically stride around the nation in a circle. And that would demonstrate his dominance over the area. The sun goes around the earth and encircles it in its protection and in its control. So encircling things was really important, as with this use of, of, of magic wands. Um, the person also mattered. It's not anyone could do this. Supposedly, you had to be a person who had the sacred power. I'm not, it's not clear to me how you gain that power. Um, some of them got it through study, um, but, but some of them also got it through visions or, you know, these were the people who saw visions. So if you, if you saw visions because maybe you had a slight touch of schizophrenia or whatever it was, and you happened to live in ancient Egypt, they would probably assign you to be a, a magician or a priest um, because you had the, you had the, the contact to the, to, the, to the other side. 
So it had to be done. You had to say the words, you had to do the deed, the ritual, and then it had to be done by the right person. Um, and the priests would often study. Now, there's a lot of text telling you how to do this. This is, let's compare it to astrology for a minute. Um, even if you think astrology is nonsense, there is a logic to astrology. There's a right way to cast a diagram. There is a, an order and, and a set of rules for how it works, or how it's supposed to work. I mean, if you just get your, your horoscope from that newspaper, it's probably making stuff up. But there's supposed to be a set of rules for how this works. Egyptian religion and magic had rules, and people would study for years to become a magician or a priest so they could learn those rules. The other uh, core Egyptian um, magic tool was the amulet. Um, they would wear amulets, and we do it too. Uh, and sometimes we don't ascribe them the same supernatural powers, but we will often wear something because it makes us feel good. And the Egyptians recognized that, that wearing these amulets created certain feelings, and they would then manipulate their feelings with them, and then they would try to manipulate the outside world with them. Um, you get things like the scarab, which I've described. And as soon as I put my mouse over here, you're going to start seeing yeah, unfortunately. This one here is um, it's actually a, a bone, a um, spine. Thank you. I couldn't think of the right words. A spine. This is, this is Osiris's spine, and it represents stability and strength, being upright and strong. Um, and so these, these magical amulets had, had different uses for different things depending on what you, if you're trying to gain health or if you're trying to exist in the next life or what have you. And the one you see most often today is the onk, right? We always wear onks. And we wear these onks as if they, you know, they're a little amulet for life and, and they make us laugh. Um, and the onk is apparently a really rare Egyptian amulet. You just almost never find it. Um, they draw it all over the walls. They almost never wore it as an amulet, for whatever reason. But we do. Um, I, I love this example of Egyptian magic, Shabtis. These are little statues. So the Egyptians thought the next world was kind of like this world, right? I mean, you're going to go there, and you're probably going to have to work, because the pharaoh calls you up to work you know, in this life, so it probably will in that. But the next life is cooler, because everyone will be able to do magic. You'll have the Shabtis. And these, these little worker statues who will go out and do the work for you, so you don't have to. And they're like union schwabtis, because you get like one, you get, they were often buried with 365 of them, so you'd have like one for every day of the year, because I guess they, the other day's off, I'm not sure. Um, and, and, you know, some of them are really amazing works of art. Some of them are just these little, almost look like little cigarette things, just little tubes of clay, if you were poor. But lots of people were buried with these things. And they were supposed to be able to work for you in the next life. And by the way, this story from Fantasia actually has an Egyptian counterpart. It was, it was pulled straight off of an Egyptian fairy tale um, where a guy brings his Schwabtis to life but isn't a very good magician and he can't make them stop. And so that's where these come from, uh, from, from Fantasia, if you've ever seen Mickey Mouse and Fantasia and the Emperor's Apprentice. Sorcerer's Apprentice. Sorcerer's Apprentice. Okay, now I'm going to tell you <clears throat> how to how to curse your um, football team that you don't like. So if you don't want the, the University of Utah to win the, the next football game and you happen to be in an Egyptian class at BYU, and, and the <laughs> University of Utah is BYU's rival, um, and, and your professor thinks it's maybe a good way to teach you about Egyptian uh, magic and, and religion, then what you do is you take a little a pot, and, and it's supposed to be made out of, of um, pottery, you know, standard pottery, and you... Um, Write on it the, the names of you know the, the, the other teams, players, etc. And you write about the other team that you don't like. And the pot is supposed to be red, by the way. I think that may have something to do with blood. Um, and then you take the pot and you smash it. Uh, and this is my fragment of said pot. And BYU lost badly after we did this. Uh, <laughs> and so I don't. I, I can pass this around, but it's a modern pot we broke <laughs> when we were. Um, when my Egyptian professor was teaching us how this works. Um, and you can find these. If you, if you dig around in Egypt, you will find little potteries with the names of all of your enemies on them that have been shattered, red, little red pots. So this is one of the ways you curse your enemies. And at least it didn't work for us. Either that or the true god of BYU was angry that we were fiddling with 
ancient Egyptian magic and decided to make us lose. I'm not sure. So um, we will actually do this in greater detail next week. Um, because so, so what we'll do, not next week, next month. Next month, we will do the unification of Egypt in a little bit greater detail. And we will talk about the pyramid text. And then we'll talk about the coffin text. And then we'll talk about the Book of the Dead. All I want to talk about here is um, well, yeah, let's just skip it, um, and we'll just talk about it next time. Uh, I do want to talk about book suggestions. Um, for those who are watching online, I'll try to um, post links down in the comments to the good ones. But I have put them up here on the stage for those of you who aren't. Um, and sometimes I've done this, and, and people don't look at the books. That's fine. Um, but this time, you ought, to, you ought to look at them. There's some, some neat books up here that are worth looking at. Um, there are a couple that I really want to recommend. If you're interested in Egyptian hieroglyphics, you want these. So most of you probably don't want to learn to read hieroglyphs. But if you do, and you change your mind and decide for whatever reason that you just got to learn to read this stuff, um, James Allen, he actually has his own weird system. It's not kind of the one that regular Egyptologists use, but it's the only real good kind of how to read Egyptian book out there. And he does a good job, and his system may actually be more accurate. A lot of times, uh, you'll they'll teach you the standard system, and then they'll then they'll tell you, well, you know, that that's just because of tradition. That's how we learn to read it. But it's probably so. There's some reasons he does things differently. Um, this is also your dictionary. This is the only dictionary you can get, and it's actually handwritten because no one had typeface for Egyptian. So you, that, I actually showed you some entries from this dictionary. He, it's handwritten. <laughs> he wrote the dictionary by hand, but he's got all the pictures of the birds, and you know. In his own, and it's, his handwriting is legible. Um, so this is your dictionary, and this is your grammar. And so this one is called Middle Egyptian by James P. Allen, and that's your your grammar. And um, the other one is called A Concise Dictionary of Middle Egyptian by Raymond O. Faulkner, and that's your dictionary. Most of you don't care about reading Egyptian though. So, but if you do, it's here. Gardner's sign list is also up there. That's that big thick book sitting there in the middle of blue. That's the sign list that I told you about. That's also fun, but you don't have to have it. And let me show you what, what you probably are more interested in, though. Hold on. <clears throat> I know, it's heavy. It's so many. Oh, so many suggestions. Okay. So, what you probably care about is Egyptian history. Probably. So, some of your history nuts, if you're history nut, this is what you want. This is Jan Asman, The Mind of Egypt. And this is the best Egyptian history book you will find. Jan Aspen, The Mind of Mystery. It's the history and meaning in the time of the pharaohs. So he covers the history, but he also talks about the religion, the meaning, the philosophy, how they thought about the world and life. And so this is really, um, we also have, you know, the Oxford history of ancient Egypt and ancient Egypt by Barry Kemp. These are also histories, these, these three books, Asman and these two were the textbooks for my Egyptian history class. Uh, these are good, but Asman is great. So if you get one, get Asman. Um, and then if you want to just read Egyptian stuff, um, this is the first thing to get. So if you're not interested in Egyptian history, but you just want to read something the Egyptians wrote, you want to read The Book of the Dead by Arlo Faulkner. If you can find it, and I think that this is still easy to find. So if you can find this, go get a copy. Um, let's see if I can turn this part off. Yes. So this is what you want: the Book of the Dead by Raymond Faulkner, um, because he has a modern translation of the Book of the Dead. Don't get budges. 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 What everyone gets, and it's out of date, and it's. And the bookstores still sell it because it's just famous, but um, it was done years before we actually knew how to read hieroglyphics right. Faulkner's got a modern translation, and he's got these beautiful, beautiful pictures of different copies of the Book of the Dead, complete with translations of all the different spells, or texts, or liturgies, whatever. So if you just want to read an Egyptian a collection of Egyptian magic spells to get into the next life, this is the book you want. To make sure you make it into heaven, get buried, be buried with it, so you can go to heaven. 
Raymond Faulkner, The Book of the Dead. Um, and then, last suggestion, and then I'm done. Um, if you want the pyramid text, though, Raymond Faulkner doesn't give that to you. There's a series of books called Ancient Egyptian Literature, Volume 1, 2, and 3, by a guy named Miriam Lichten, Lichten, uh, who has starts with the pyramid text. So he's got you know the pyramid text. He's got the shipwrecked sailor. He's got some of these fun stories, um, some of the fir world's first literature ever, um, and some of the, the you know, uh, trees between different kings and pharaohs and, and things. So it's got treaties in it, it's got literature in it, it's got poetry in it, it's got um, praises to different gods. Um, when Akhenaten decides to be monotheist, it's got his hymns to the sun god, to the autumn, or in it. And it's got, of course, the pieces of the Book of the Dead. But it's also got the pyramid text, the coffin text, and all that other stuff that came before it. Um, and it's just it's just a selection. So what he's done is he's kind of from each time period he selected some of the most interesting stories that the Egyptians told and put them in a volume. So this is cool. Um, if you can get a hold of this, this is this is fun stuff. So thank you. Any last questions, comments? Yes. I don't, but what I'm going to do is when I go home tomorrow, I'm going to go into my presentation, which should, I've, it should have streamed live, but now it'll be recorded. I can go into the recording and I will put them in the first comment. Either that or, or I'll edit the, the description and put them in there. But I will put a bibliography up for everybody. I'll put it on my slides. Yeah. Okay, so we will talk about that um, next time in great detail, but the short answer is during the Old Kingdom, there seems to be a belief that the Pharaoh is a god on earth, and Osiris was resurrected because he was a god, and the Pharaoh can be resurrected because he's a god on earth. Um, during the first intermediate period, and it's not clear what they thought about the commoners. Um, and yet the commoners were buried with grave goods, so somebody was hoping. Yeah. Uh, during the first intermediate period, though, the, the spells to help the pharaoh get to the next life start to be buried with the commoners, too. So um, the degree to which the religion was interwoven in other people's lives uh, is, is sometimes hard to tell because the other people didn't always leave us the same degree of writing yeah. that the rich and the famous did. But the further you go in Egyptian history, the more democratized that gets. So that by the time of um, the Greek period, um, temples to Isis are, are popping up all over the world, up in, into England. There are temples to Isis in England where people went through an um, initiation. So an initiation ritual was associated with ISIS worship, very much like kind of modern Freemasonry or, um, or you know, entering a fraternity or another club or, or like the Eleusinian Mysteries in Greece. And it was extraordinarily popular. And it was headed everywhere. Apparently, and we don't even know for sure what they did in their initiations, but whatever it was, people liked it. It was cool. <laughs> and and you know it's always nice to know that you, you know the secret thing that no one else knows and it was a secret which is why we don't know what happened but christianity killed it so it, it had left egypt and it had spread around the world and it was clearly something the common person was interested in and then christianity killed it and it vanished which is too bad because i wish somebody had written down what really went on before it vanished um, we do have a few christian writers um, making fun of it um, so we have enemies of it, you know, writing about the, the debauchery that went on. The thing is, they don't trust those sources. Um, but yeah, this is something that, that certainly originates with the pharaohs or is, is strongly associated with them, but it spreads to everybody quickly. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not sure which one you're talking about, but... Um, well, one is the picture of uh, the pharaoh holding somebody by the hair. Okay. And then the other one, they had pictures of strange-looking animals that had their necks in twine. Yes. And 
OK, so yeah, I skipped that picture, didn't I? Um, let me go back to it. Because um, kind of what I said was that um, we'll come back to, uh, to the pre-dynastic pre -dynastic period at a later date, um, because we just don't have time. But I can tell you what, what the pictures are. Um, so there's your smiting scene. Um, you've seen that smiting scene before, I showed you. So it's from the earliest document to the latest. This is the earliest document. So this is the Narmer palette. It's actually a palette for grinding cosmetics. Um, well, you put the cosmetics right here, and you grind them up, and then you can actually wear eye makeup, or you can put the eye makeup on the deity. This is a really big palette, so it's probably for ritual purposes. And what this palette, we think, shows is the unification of Egypt by the fir first king of the of Dynasty Zero. We actually had to create Dynasty Zero. We got our numbering up. So we realized there's more dynasties than we thought we actually started backwards from one. But this is Dynasty Zero. This is the first king of the Dynasty Zero. And we believe he's unifying Egypt. And he's the first to put that smiting scene on his, well, somewhere where we've seen it anyway. And then it goes all the way through the late period. So, um, OK, so up, up here, out, yeah, so there's a lot of strange creatures. There's these. I don't actually know what those are. This is his name. This is a palace facade, which tells us he's a king. And the name is written right here, Narmer. So that's his name, Narmer. That name is also written here. And then we get these two strange creatures. They look almost like giraffes, uh, lion heads, giraffe necks. I don't know what bodies that is. Um, <clears throat> we don't have a clue what those are because they don't exist in real life. Um, and they don't seem to show up in many other places. But they're some sort of a mythological creature. The, they, the intertwined necks produce the spot for grinding the cosmetics in this case. So they're artistic in their design. But in this case, they also seem to have something to do with uniting Upper and Lower Egypt. So I'm, you know, part of what I wanted to talk about and how this ties into magic is you notice the Pharaoh's crown. He's got one crown here and another crown here. This is the red, cre red crown of Lower Egypt. This is the white crown of Upper Egypt. And that's why we think this has to do with him unifying Upper and Lower Egypt. And this is where we get crowns from. And we still have crowns as the Senate king kingship. And it, it seems to originate from Egypt. Um, and this is his sandal bearer. He's actually carrying sandals. It's not like somebody wanted, this king wanted to change his sandals every five minutes. But in this case, some, he's got someone carrying his sandal. The, the term sandal bearer is a name for the vizier. So we already have. Um, officials. We have bureaucracy, we have a king doing the smiting, and we have him making himself king of Upper and Lower Egypt, and then we have these two animals being entwined together, um, almost like a male and a female being brought together, uh, and, and they're, they're mythologizing the, um, the founding of Egypt. Um, and so we'll start talking about mythology, and we'll talk about the connection between real historical events and mythological events, and events that are typological, that are seen to, re to repeat over and over, just like that time and eternity bit, right? Certain mythological elements will repeat over and over. And so the king will reenact this scene over and over. Every pharaoh from this moment on will reenact this scene to some extent to prove his, his kingship. Yeah. Yeah, that's just two pictures, one picture of both sides of the same object. And that battery thing appears on whichever screen I have my mouse on. So. <laughs> I thought it was appearing on both when I was really struggling to get rid of it. Once I realized it was only on mine, if I put my mouse on my side, we just kept going. <laughs> yeah. Alpha, you wanted to see, so what she said is she wanted to see the alphabet again. So let me back up to the, I assume the easy alphabet, not the biliterals and the triliterals. And, <laughs> so by the way, if you Google this, there you'll find a million of these. Uh, you know, they, they pass these little papyrus sheets with the alphabet on it out to every tourist who goes to visit, you know, the pyramids or something. They'll just hand these things out and charge you five cents. I mean, this is how the kids make their living is drawing these little sheets out in hand. If you Google it, you will find this sheet written a thousand different ways. Just Google Egyptian alphabet and and then, yeah, the, the whole write your name thing is a really good, um, just fun thing that everyone ought to do once in their life. So, 
I know I've never given you homework before, but do this one. Go go write your name. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, so what, what in Egyptian, uh, and I can help you with this, you want, this is a K sound. So when the C makes the K sound, it's written this way. When the C makes the S sound, it's written this way because that's an S. And i got to get my mouse off that screen so that thing stops popping up. Um, yeah, well, that's because, you know, in English, E and I make, can, can, can make the same sounds. That's an English thing. Um, the single read is, a, is a sh kind of a short E, and the double read is a long Y or E, a long E sound. And actually, it's not quite that either. It's, it's, a, it's a pseudo vowel that doesn't really have an exact duplicate in English, but it's close enough. Yeah, so uh, how do you figure out how to pronounce this stuff? Therein lies an actual interesting tale because. We know Cleopatra, we know how to pronounce her name because it's written in Greek. We know how, that we have these letters on the, the cartouche, right? So that gives you a few letters. What you do is you then find other names that we have Greek variants for, and, and from the names you pull down all the letters of the alphabet you can find. And then from the context you figure out words. Um, and once you know the Coptic, you figure out the words you don't know, and then you try to figure out pronunciation. Now, the, the trick is Coptic is your key to all of this because the Coptic um, is still spoken today. So it's not true that no one speaks this stuff. No one writes this stuff. People still speak it. The Coptics still speak it. The problem is they've been speaking it for a few thousand years and things have drifted. And so um, we, can, we can look at enough of the words, though, to figure out the alphabet, right? Because this, this letter shows up in all these words, and this one has drifted, but these others are so the majority of the Coptic words that have this letter in it are pronounced this way. That letter probably is pronounced this way. It gets worse when you don't speak vowels, because the Egyptian doesn't write the vowels. And so you have the same problem we have with some Hebrew words, which is we don't really know what the vowels are. Um, and if the Coptic word isn't preserved and isn't preserved right, then we have to guess. And so there's something called classroom Egyptian. And this is why your Egyptian gods, this will confuse the heck out of you. This is why Egyptian gods have like five names. It's because classroom pronunciation just says, we know we don't know the vowels. We're not going to try. We'll just put E's everywhere. And when you do that, you get Ray. It just so happens, though, that Ray is preserved in Greek and other texts because they talked about the Egyptian god Ray. And when they write it, they write Ra. So the vowel happened to be an A, not an A. So classroom pronunciation is Ray. You don't worry about it. If you just happen to have a Greek description of the word, we happen to know that it's a long A. But, but that, that makes it really confusing. Which words do you pronounce as we know they were pronounced, and which words do you pronounce classroom? Especially since it takes an expert in Egyptian to know which words we know how to pronounce and which we don't. Because you only know how to pronounce about half of them. So the answer to that is almost always we just do classroom pronunciation and that's just what we do <laughs> when we're studying Egyptian, right? But when we start giving classes about the gods, suddenly you get Greek pronunciations cropping in like Ray and Ron and then people get confused. It's even worse for Isis. Like every Egyptian god that's female has a T in her name. Every female god should end in a T. Isis doesn't end in a T because that's the Greek name for her. She was actually worshipped by the Greeks, too, so her Egyptian name is Isit. So, which, of course, you know, when you start reading her, reading it written in Egyptian, there's, it's written Isit, not Isis. So, but everyone calls her Isis. If I called her Isit, you'd have no idea what I was talking about. So the, the, the further down that rabbit hole you go, how to pronounce things, the worse it gets. I'm sorry to say and it's always, and then that creates all sorts of fun jokes. So somebody bothered to hire an Egyptian for, who, who, who here's seen The Mummy? You know how The Mummy, the, the new movie, The Mummy, the relatively new. The Mummy speaks in Egyptian. If you notice that, he actually speaks Egyptian to people, or he's supposed to be speaking, you know, he speaks a foreign language. He's actually speaking Egyptian. They bothered to hire an Egyptologist to teach them to speak Egyptian. So The Mummy in that movie is speaking Egyptian. 
perfect, flawless classroom pronunciation <laughs> right? Which is always really funny because for, for, so I'm the only person who, you know, me and, me and one or two others who watch that movie and just laugh because, because of his pronunciation. He's got, you can hear it, it's E's everywhere. Every vowel is an E and it's because he's, it's because we don't know what the real vowels are. So they hired an Egyptologist to teach him to speak classroom Egyptian instead of real Egyptian. I don't know. But there are some letters and words we know how to pronounce. He didn't even try. It's just fun. Okay. Any other? I mean, people can leave. I've kept you way long, but if people are asking questions, I'll keep answering. <laughs> okay. Thanks, everybody. I appreciate it.